Well, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We've been with you for 18 years as we turn to another story. Yes. Now we turn to the story of a University of California scientist who discovered that a popular herbicide may have harmful effects on the endocrine system. Tyrone Hayes was first hired in 1997 by a company that later became agribusiness giant Syngenta. They asked him to study their, prod their product, atrazine, a pesticide that is applied to more than half the corn crops in the United States and widely used on golf courses and Christmas tree farms. But after Hayes found results that the, the manufacturer did not expect, that atrazine causes sexual abnormalities in frogs and could cause the same problems for humans, Syngenta refused to allow him to publish his work. This was the start of an epic feud between the scientist and the corporation. Now a new article in The New Yorker magazine uses court documents from a class action lawsuit against Syngenta to show how it sought to prevent the Environmental Protection Agency from banning the profitable chemical, which is already banned by the European Union. To start with, the company's public relations team drafted a list of four goals. Reporter Rachel Aviv writes, quote, the first was, quote, discredit Hayes. In a spiral-bound notebook, Syngenta's communications manager, Sherry Ford, who referred to Hayes by his initials, wrote that the company could prevent citing of TH data by revealing him as non-credible. He was a frequent topic of conversation at company meetings. Syngenta looked for ways to exploit Hayes, faults, problems. If TH involved in scandal, Enviros will drop him, Ford wrote. Well, for more, we're joined by TH himself. That's right. Tyrone Hayes is with us, professor of integrative biology at the University of California, Berkeley, joining us from the campus TV station right now in Berkeley. Welcome to Democracy Now! Um, can you tell us what happened to you, how you were originally tied to Syngenta, the research you did, and what prevented you from originally publishing it? Well, <clears throat> here at Berkeley, I was a, a new assistant professor. I was already studying the effects of hormones and the effects of chemicals that interfere with hormones on amphibian development. And I was approached by the manufacturer and asked to study the effects of atrazine, uh, the herbicide, on frogs. And after I discovered that it interfered with male development and caused uh, males to turn into females to develop eggs, the company tried to prevent me from publishing and from discussing that work with other scientists outside of their panel. What was the process within the company as you raised the, your findings? Uh, what was their immediate reaction uh, to, uh, to what you had come across? Well, initially they seemed uh, sort of supportive. Um, we, you know, we designed more studies, we designed more analysis, and they encouraged me to do more analysis. But as the further analysis uh, just supported the original finding, they became less interested in moving forward very quickly, and eventually they moved to asking me to manipulate data or to rep misrepresent data, and ultimately they told me I could not publish or could not talk about the data outside of their closed panel. And uh, Professor Hayes, talk about exactly what you found. What were the abnormalities you found in frogs, the gender-bending nature of uh, this drug, mm -hmm. atrazine? Well, initially we found that the larynx or the voice box in exposed males didn't grow properly. And this was an indication that the male hormone testosterone was not being produced uh, at appropriate levels. And eventually we found that not only did were these males demasculized or chemically castrated, but they also were starting to develop ovaries or starting to develop eggs. And eventually we discovered that these males didn't breed properly, uh, that some of the males actually completely turned into females. So we had genetic males that were laying eggs and reproducing as females. And now we're starting to show that some of these males actually show, um, I guess, what, what we'd call homosexual behavior. They actually prefer to mate with other males. And so where did you go with your research? Uh, well, eventually what happened was the EPA uh, insisted that uh, the Environmental Protection Agency insisted that the manufacturer release me from the confidentiality contract. And we published our findings in pretty high-ranking journals, such as Proceedings at the National Academy of Sciences. We published some work in uh, Nature. We published work in Environmental Health Perspectives, which is a journal sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. And when did you begin to get a sense that the company was organizing a campaign uh, against you? What were the signs that you saw uh, uh, post the, the period when you be, uh, published your findings? 
Uh, before we published the findings and before the EPA became involved, the company tried to purchase the data. They tried to give me a new contract so that they would then control the data and the experiments. They actually tried to get me to come and visit the company to get control of those data. And when I refused, I invited them to the university. I offered to share data, but they wanted to purchase the data. And then they actually, <clears throat> as mentioned in a New York article, they actually hired scientists to try to refute the data or to pick apart the data, and eventually they hired scientists to do experiments that they claim refuted our data, and, and then that escalated to the company actually, Tim Pasteur in particular, um, and others from the company coming to presentations that, or lectures that I was giving to um, make handouts or to stand up and refute the data, and eventually it even led to things like threats of violence. Um, Tim Pasteur, for example, before I would give a talk, would, uh, would literally threaten, whisper in my ear that he could have me lynched, or he would quote, said he would send some of his good old boys to show me what it's like to be gay, or he, at one point he threatened my wife and my daughter with, with sexual violence. Uh, he would whisper things like, your wife's at home alone right now. How do you know I haven't sent somebody there to take care of her? Isn't your daughter there? So eventually it really slipped into some you know, pretty, pretty scary tactics. Um, so what did you do? I mean, you're actually, I mean, this is very serious. You could bring criminal charges if you're being threatened and stalked in this way. Well, uh, initially, I went to my vice chancellor here at the university. I went to my dean. I went to legal counsel here at the university. And I was told by legal counsel that, well, I was told, first of all, by the vice chancellor for research at the time, that, well, you publish the work, it's over. So I don't understand what the problem is. And I tried to impress upon her, uh, Beth Burnside at the time, that, you know, that it, that it wasn't over, that I was really being pursued by, by the manufacturer. And eventually, uh, when I spoke with the lawyer here at the university, I was told that, well, I represent the university and I protect the university from liability. You're kind of on your own. And, and I remember I looked at him and I said, but the very university from the Latin universitas is a collection of scholars, of teachers and, and students. So who is this entity, the university that you represent that doesn't include me? But clearly there's some entity that, that, that doesn't really include us, the professors and students, and, and doesn't really protect our academic freedom, I think, the way that it should. I wanted to ask you about one of your critics, Elizabeth Whalen, president of the American Council on Science and Health. When the New York Times ran a critical story about the herbicide as part of its toxic water series in 2009, she referred to its reporting as, quote, all the news that's fit to scare. This is a clip of Whalen from an interview on MSNBC. I very much disagree with the New York Times story, which is really raising uh, concerns about a totally bogus risk. Atrazine has been used for more than 50 years. It's very, very tightly regulated. Even the Environmental Protection Agency, which is not known for uh, soft peddling about uh, environmental chemicals, even they say it's safe. Well, it turns out that Syngenta has been a long-term financial supporter of Whalen's organization, the American Council on Science and Health, paying them at least $100,000. Uh, your uh, comments on, uh, on her remarks? Well, again, they're paid remarks. And one of the most disheartening things in this whole process is that many of my critics, you know, it's one to be academic if you come and say, well, we interpreted the data this way and we want to argue about this point. But these people really didn't even have... An opinion. These, these opinions were written by the manufacturer, and they were paid to put their names on them to endorse the opinions of the manufacturer. So, you know, that's one of the most disheartening things, that, that they were really just personalities for sale. Um, and many of the things that, that she's saying there is just not true. There, any independent study uh, from any scientist that's not funded by Syngenta has found similar problems with atrazine, not just my work on frogs, but I've just published a paper with 22 scientists from around the world, from 12 different countries, who've shown that atrazine causes sexual problems in mammals, and that atrazine causes sexual problems in birds, amphibians, fish. So it's not just my work in amphibians. Uh, in amphibians. Uh, and also with regards to the EPA, one of the scientific advisory panel members on the EPA that was supposed to review atrazine, turns out, is paid and works for Syngenta. So the whole process was tainted. And in fact, the EPA ignored the scientific advisory panel's 
opinion and actually decided to keep atrazine on the market and not to do any more studies when that clearly wasn't the recommendation of the scientific advisory panel. I, I wanted to go back in a second to your remarks about your university, because obviously there are many questions about uh, major universities around the country uh, being in some way or other supported financially by the pharmaceutical or the drug industry. Uh, but you are at a prestigious university, one of the top universities in the country at Berkeley. Uh, do you have some concerns about how uh, uh, how your university responded to your in your time of need and your the attack uh, on your uh, academic integrity? Well, they're not just my concerns. There are many at the university.